Alrighty. Um, hi, my name's uh, Brooke Hodgman. I work here in Melbourne at an indie company called Goatee Entertainment. Um, and I'm here to talk about writing parallel code for game engines. Um, so if you want to read the slides later, there's a link there, um, tinycc slash parallel engine. Um, but I'm going to jump straight in because um, I'm bad at public speaking and I've got a lot of slides. So um, when I was writing this, I was ranting a lot. So I really should have called the talk like, multi-threading is bullshit, because there's a lot that can go wrong. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start kind of back when I was in school, what I learned and how I entered the industry. Um, so in my first job interview, I got thrown the question, how would you make a game multi-threaded? And this was quite a while ago. So a decade and a half ago, people didn't write multi-threaded games because we didn't need to. Everything was, everything was single core, and this was kind of more of a theoretical thing that we knew we had to face in the future. So being the good student that I was, the easy question is, you know, you, you, you use locks and you make it thread safe, and that's that. Everyone knows multi-threading. You just wrap everything in mutexes and you're done. Uh, and the other answer is just an excuse that games aren't a good fit for multi-threading. And you don't hear that these days much anymore because you kind of have to use multi-threading if you're making a console game. But a decade ago, people used to say this a lot and believe it. Um, so both of these answers are bullshit. They're not true. Um, so the summary kind of what I learned in school is that if you've got data that you're sharing, you need to lock it. Straightforward. If you want to do some concurrent work, you use the fork and join pattern where you spawn a new thread to do your parallel workload and then you wait on that thread to finish. Um, if something's a blocking operation, you can wrap it up in a non-blocking, you can turn it into a non-blocking operation by wrapping it up in a thread. Uh, you can put systems on their own thread, like you have your rendering system and your, your update system. And all this is correct, but it's all bullshit as well. Um, so it's bullshit because it leads to some really bad ideas, such as wrapping every single object in a lock. Um, so scene graphs used to be the rage, and there was a bunch of architectures where you put a lock on every node in your scene graph so that the renderer can touch it or the update loop can touch it. Or you make a game server where every single client gets their own thread. Um, you spawn threads all the time whenever you've got new work to do. And you've got all these different systems. You've got your render loop and your update loop, and they're all running at different frequencies, and there's no control over that. It just kind of falls out magically from the threading system. So those ideas from school, they're not wrong. They're just not the best thing for a game engine. So they do work great if you're writing a typical GUI application, a word processor or whatever, where you've got a mostly idle main thread that has events that it pumps out of a queue and it does a small amount of work in them, or if it has to do a large amount of work for a couple of seconds, it'll spawn a new thread and do that work, and then when that work's finished, it'll lock some tiny GUI object and dump its results in there, and that's, that's all fine. But games are not typical GUI apps. With games, we're kind of pretending that we're writing real-time systems, where we're trying to say we have to have results every 16 milliseconds or some tiny amount of time. Um, so the kind of overheads that you ignore on a human scale system where you're waiting a second is fine aren't really applicable for games. So the first topic we'll cover is, you know, when do you create threads and how do you manage them? So the kind of bad way of doing this is you spawn a thread for every system. So we're going to say we've got an update system, and we've got a render system, and they just run a loop. So your update threads just update, 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 and your render threads render, 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 render. Um, but this is a terrible idea. And this goes hand in hand with like object level locking, where you've got your scene graph and you've got all your nodes in it. And whenever the renderer needs some state, it'll lock a node and read the state out. And this is just complete bullshit because it leads to completely non-deterministic rendering where you can see there's the object state over, over time there is slowly merging from one color to the next as you've got this purple update and then you've got an orange update. And then the update thread can't do every object simultaneously. It does them one at a time. So if the render threads running simultaneously and just sampling object state out of that, it's going to get some objects updated and other ones not. And you're going to have objects kind of jittering between frame positions and all sorts of terrible things. And there's actually, actually games that have shipped using this, which is bad. So the way you fix that is these kind of systems have to 
be all about pipelining. So your update thread and your render thread have to form some kind of pipeline where at the end of every update, you need to make some kind of snapshot of the state that the renderer requires. So if that's all, you've, all of your object positions, for example, then update has to end by snapshotting your object positions and then the renderer thread can work on that snapshot so it's got a coherent view of the world. And this is actually adequate. A lot of games use this kind of model. Even though it, it only scales to two threads, you've got an update thread and a renderer thread. That was kind of fine when dual-core CPUs were the rage. Um, and it's still better than nothing now. You can see compared to a single-threaded timeline, where we've got one thread doing this, the um, two-threaded version, because it overlaps the frames slightly, it'll finish those three frames a lot earlier. Um, but the other bad point, besides the fact that it only uses two threads, is it won't completely use those two threads. You can see here, say the renderer job is cheaper than the update job, it's going to go idle while it waits for each render to finish. So you're only really using one and a half cores out of however many cores you've got available in your system. So you can fill up those idle times if you want and get your frame rate up even higher. So the way you do that is, um, if you've read that famous Gaffron Games article on fixing your time step, this is basically that, where you've got a game state and you update and you produce a new game state and you always keep two of them around in memory and then the renderer thread reads the previous two game states and interpolates them together to produce some kind of mixed blended result of those two states. So even if uh, the update thread is running too slowly, uh, which happens a lot in real-time strategy games. They often update as slow as 10 or 20 hertz, whereas you want your renderer running at 60 hertz. So you actually do multiple render steps and you'll smooth out these game states by blending between them. So then you finish another update, produce a new game state, and now we start blending between these two, and blend between those two, and another update and so on. You keep blending into the newest game state. So this lets you, now we're going to saturate two cores, although you kind of, you depending on which, what your game genre is, you may or may not be wasting time here by running that thread even faster than it has to be. No point rendering at 600 hertz, for example. Um, so that's kind of the thread per system model of threading very quickly. So then the other thing that we learned back in school was fork and join. And this was invented back in the 60s. It's been around forever, and it's still a key part of programming, like this is what we should be using. The reason that it was bullshit is the way that we did it in school was we spawned a new thread. So whenever we had some serial work and then we knew, okay, we've got some parallel work here. I've got a thousand objects and they're all independent. So I'm gonna launch three threads to do, you know, 333 of them each. Um, we'd, we'd spawn three threads and then we'd wait for them to die at the end and do some more serial work. Um, we really don't want to be doing that. So these days, pretty much every single game engine is built on top of a thread pool at its core. So with a thread pool, um, we pre-create some number of threads and we keep them alive for the entire course of the application. So the, the theory behind threads that we used in fork join was they're just a tool that we use to run some code in parallel, but the reality is that they're an abstraction over some hardware in the CPU and the CPUs will have a certain fixed number of hardware threads. And each software thread maps onto one of those hardware threads. And if you make more software threads than there are hardware threads, then the OS has to juggle resources around. And if you make less, you're not making use of the CPU. So on PCs, there's an instruction you can use called CPU ID to ask the CPU all sorts of details about itself. You want to use that and ask it how many hardware threads it has available and then you want to make one software thread for every hardware thread, basically. Um, maybe a little bit less than that if you want to be nice to other, other programs running on the PC, if the user's um, got their email running in the background or whatever. Um, so on a four-core PC, you make four threads and you keep them alive for the whole program. And then on top of this, pretty much every single game engine has settled on the job system which there's a lot of different ways to build these. Um, there's a few good blogs on the internet that go into great depth on how to build one of these things. There's some open source ones. Um, these make use of the threads in the thread pool and they run a really simple loop, which is basically 
the loop is just try and pop a job out of a queue. And if you can, run that job. Um, so we want to do this so that we can have the benefits of fork join. We can go parallel whenever we want to. Um, but we don't want to have the overhead of creating and destroying hardware resources constantly. Um, we can also still run our thread per system code, which is great. We can also still run single threaded code. So you can kind of, you can throw a job system into a game and then slowly migrate your way over towards it if you're coming from a single threaded or a thread per system design. And the good thing about job systems is they're going to scale up. So if you have a 32 core processor in the future, you just make 32 threads and your jobs will get distributed among them. So the way that you build these is, yeah, we have these jobs. And a job is basically a function pointer and some arguments that are going to be passed to that function pointer. So as long as you can break down whatever you're working on into a function pointer and some arguments, and then you can throw that into a queue, then we can still do fork join now, except we've got these three permanent threads that live there forever, and they're constantly trying to pop jobs out of this queue whenever there's stuff in there. So we've got our serial work here. It's going to push a whole bunch of parallel work into the queue, and then immediately the threads are going to start grabbing that out of the queue and executing them. Um, so this is, this is the bread and butter of any modern game engine. So at the core of pretty much everything is job systems now. And the good thing about this is we can still, we can hijack these threads in the thread pool and we can tell them to run our own game loops instead of running that really simple loop that just says pop jobs. So we can, if we've got our update thread and our render thread from before, where our render thread used to go idle while it was waiting for an update to finish, an idle thread now you can tell it to basically run the job loop until the condition that you're waiting for is, has um, been satisfied. So then when the render is finished and it's waiting on a new update to finish, it'll sit there pop, trying to pop jobs out of the queue. So any data parallel workloads that the update thread is producing, they'll run on the render thread as well as running on any extra background threads. Um, so this is quite a good design. You can, you can take your system that worked well on a dual core PC and now if your user runs it on a quad core PC, any of your fork join tasks are just going to spread out across those extra threads. And you're not going to create too many threads or too little. You're going to make just the right number. Um, so it's important when you're doing this, you need to keep an eye on kind of what's happening with all of your thread, your jobs and stuff, and make sure you don't have crazy dependencies that are causing all of your threads to stall. So um, this screenshot is actually out of the game we're working on at the moment. Um, that's a single frame, I'm pretty sure. Um, and this is actually in the Chrome browser. If you get the Chrome browser and you navigate to Chrome colon slash slash tracing, they've got this great profiling tool built in that they use to you know, keep on top of Chrome's performance. Um, so we just collect data out of our game and we dump it out in Chrome's JSON format, which they document. And then we load it up in here so I didn't actually have to write a visualizing tool. Um, so every engine should have an intrusive profiler in it, which is basically uh, begin end pairs that you put into your code so you can tell how much time is being taken up by every different system. There's no point guessing. Profiling always has to, oh, optimization always has to be backed by profiling data to tell you where your time is being spent. So there's no point trying to parallelize some system if it only runs for a microsecond. So, Next topic is that thread safe as a phrase is bullshit. I hate this phrase, thread safe. So like if somebody says, you know, is this system thread safe? What, what does that mean? So the, the simple version is that if data is read only, it's thread safe. And if data is written to, it's not thread safe. If data is written to by a thread, you need to put some kind of synchronization primitive in there to ensure that the threads um, don't stomp each other's work and they all see correct data and don't get corrupted. Um, and that little asterisk there is basically like, because read-only data has to come from somewhere, so it has to be writable at some point in time when it you know, came into existence. So you still need synchronization when you're transferring data from being a writable state when it was created to being read-only and, and safely accessible by every thread. Um, on x86, on PC, that usually you don't really have to do anything, it'll just work. But 
theoretically, um, it is a very important step to put in there, you know, memory fences and stuff I'm not really going to go into. Um, so yeah, when somebody says, is, it, is something thread safe? It's kind of more interesting to say, what, what is something that isn't thread safe? So a bunch of different examples. We've got, kind of got a really simple API on the right there. We've got a library with a class in it, and the class has a function. Um, so somebody might say, if one thread is calling any functions from my library, then no other thread may do so. So basically, the whole library is not thread safe. Uh, and that's quite common. Um, you'll see um, Direct 3D9 and a whole bunch of other bits of middleware. They'll just, they're just not written to accommodate multi-threaded engines. So basically, if you've got a library like this, you need to either just give it to one thread and say that thread interacts with the library and no other thread does, or you need to wrap the whole library up in a lock and say whenever anyone wants to use the library, they're going to get that global lock. Um, and this is because there's like hidden global state inside that library. Um, another situation which is less common is the same thing, but just on a class level. So if somebody's trying to use my class, then only one thread can have, have that at a time. And that would occur, like say there was a static, static variable inside a class, which is why you should try to minimize global state and class, class global state, which is like class static members, because they just, um, they're going to enforce this kind of non-thread safety on you, which you don't want. But the last one is actually a really good thing. So the last one says, if one thread is calling functions on an instance of my class, so if you've got a particular object, then no other thread can use that object. So you actually want that level of not thread safe. You, you want your typical objects to say, I'm not thread safe as an object, but only as an object. So the whole library, you can use, other threads can use the library, other threads can use the class, just other threads can't use the one object at the same time. So as long as two threads are operating on two objects, that's fine. Um, so this is actually good. If, if, the, if an object was thread safe, then you kind of have to ask the question like, well, what are you doing to make it thread safe? There's some cost in there. Thread safety has a cost and we don't want that. We want to we wanna pay that cost at a higher level so it's cheaper. So I don't like the phrase thread safe. So in this particular situation, we've got a, we've got a class here which has some internal state, an integer, and then the function modifies that. So therefore, an object isn't thread safe because it's modifying data. So I would say that this class must be externally synchronized and also can be externally synchronized. So that would mean if you want it to be thread safe, we've got a, a function here called thread safe. Um, if you want to share this object between different threads, you know, you need to synchronize it somehow. So in this example, I've wrapped it up in a mutex, which is me synchronizing that object externally. So most objects, instead of saying, you know, I'm not thread safe or I am thread safe, most objects should say, I can be externally synchronized. Um, whereas if somebody says, my class is thread safe, you kind of got to be a little bit suspicious and say, what are you doing? In so in this example, somebody might say this class is thread safe. Or if they're cluey, they might say this class is internally synchronized, in which case there's a member variable in there, which is a mutex. So inside the function, they're locking it and unlocking it. Um, and this can be bad, because maybe you're writing single-threaded code. Maybe you don't need to share the data, and you're paying the cost of all these locks for no reason. Or maybe you want to synchronize things at a higher level, and you, you've got all this fine-grained locking, which you don't want. So internal synchronization usually should only exist on very large objects. So like in Direct3D11, it exists on the device. So if you create a texture or some big operation like that, that's, that's internally synchronized, but the small stuff isn't. Um, so this is actually, a, in the general case, trying to provide thread safety like this is a bad idea. Um, and a really, a worse situation is somebody might say, oh, my library is thread safe. And what they've done is they've basically just made a global lock. And then inside every single function, they, they're acquiring that lock. Um, and if you just take them at, at their word and you say, oh, their library's thread safe, that's great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin up eight threads and I'm going to get eight threads to try and use it at the same time. And then you get worse performance than single-threaded code because only one of them can operate at the time, plus you're playing the, the thread overhead. Um, 
because what they've actually done is they've inter internally synchronized the entire library with a single lock, which is a terrible thing to do. So thread safe really means you need to ask more questions. You need to say, you need to know how things are synchronized. Because um, if you're writing engine code, I assume you care about performance. You're not writing a, a spreadsheet where you can wait a second between operations. Um, so if we're going to look at an example, shared pointer from C++, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a reference counting pointer, kind of like a garbage collecting system. So it points to an object and it also points to a, re a reference counter for that object saying how many, how many systems are using it. Um, and it's a common misconception that shared point is thread safe. It's actually not. The guarantee that um, the MSDN documentation gives about it is that um, multiple threads can simultaneously read and write different shared pointer objects even when the objects are copies that share ownership, which is a bit of a mouthful. So if we break that in half, the first half of that, saying that multiple threads can use different objects, is a fancy way of saying that you're allowed to externally synchronize it. And if you do that, that's enough. So there's no shared state at the library level. There's no magic class shared state or anything. If you just put um, some kind of synchronization around your own objects to make sure that two threads don't use the one object at the same time, then that's enough. Um, and if there is any internal hidden state, then the library is internally synchronizing it. And it turns out in this case there is because that's what the second half of their description refers to. So a shared pointer has a pointer to some kind of type and it's got a pointer to a reference count. And the situation they describe is even when the objects are copies that share ownership, that means you've got two different shared pointer objects but they're actually sharing the same reference count. So this sentence from Microsoft is actually saying that that internal reference count is internally synchronized somehow. So you've got two objects, and two threads are allowed to operate on those two different objects, even though they're sharing this one integer somehow. Um, so that should kind of be a red flag. That should scare you and say, well, what are they doing that's um, making this safe to, to occur? Um, that's what I just said. Um, so how do they, how do, they do that? Um, and yeah, the answer is atomics, but the simple way that you'd do it is you'd think, well, maybe, you know, maybe they've chucked a mutex in there and they're locking and unlocking it. That's the simple way to do internal synchronization. And that's kind of overkill, although that's kind of what you should be thinking of when they say that the reference counter is internally synchronized through their cryptic description. This is what you should be thinking in your head and you should kind of be scared of it because of that. Because um, this is going to be quite expensive to lock and unlock that reference count every time you copy a pointer around. Especially, as this seems a bit crazy to me, so everyone who's writing C++ code that's single-threaded, you're doing all of this synchronization on your reference counts just in case you might one day want to make a multi-threaded program. Um, kind of goes against C++'s um, philosophy of opting in and only paying for what you need. But it's not quite as bad as that, so the way that they actually do it is there's this standard atomic class now. So there's, it, this integer is atomic. Um, and atomics map down to hardware instructions. So normally if you're going to increment a reference count, you've got to read that integer from memory, then increment it and then write it back to memory, which is three steps. So two threads, if they're trying to do those at the same time, they could have a race condition and stomp each other's data, which is bad. So Putting it, wrapping it in a mutex would make those three steps atomic, or if you just use a standard atomic, um, CPUs these days can do an atomic increment, well, where they will fetch it from memory, increment it, write it back to memory in one uninterruptible instruction. Um, so that's what they do. So there's still a cost to that. It's similar to a cache miss, or similar to locking a mutex, because mutexes internally will be built using a standard atomic. It's just maybe like half the cost of, of if you'd wrap this up in a, in a mutex. Um, and if you start going down this road and you start playing with atomics, um, they're amazing for micro-optimizing all of your internal threading details. So um, one of the key, most key instructions is the atomic exchange. So as well as the reference count there would use an atomic increment. Uh, atomic exchange is basically write a value to memory and give me the value that used to be there. And this is how a mutex will be implemented. So with a mutex, you say, uh, you make an integer and you say zero means it's unlocked and one means that it's locked. 
and you can use atomic exchange to try and write a one into memory. And if you get back a zero, you know you've just transitioned it from unlocked to locked. So that gives you a safe mutex. But if you try and write a one to memory and you get back the previous value of one, you know that it was already locked before you wrote the one. So it's you haven't locked it. Um, so in that case, you actually sit here in a loop, continually doing an atomic exchange of one until you get back a zero saying that you know, you've, you've actually succeeded in that locking transaction. Um, and the more advanced version is the atomic compare and swap, um, which is basically write x to memory if the value in memory was y. So you can, you can do a, if the value is this, do the write, otherwise return false. And that's all wrapped up in a single nice instruction. Um, and out of that atomic compare and swap, um, you can build all sorts of wonderful data structures. And the most important one is the lock-free queue. So every kind of job system at its core, it's going to have a lock-free queue, uh, which allows any thread to shove jobs into it and any thread to pop jobs out of it without having to bother with mutexes. Um, and these are really complicated. There was a talk here at GCAP in 2007 where I think it was Pete Isinzi, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, he came and gave a talk on lock-free data structures for the Xbox 360 and I ran home and made a lock-free queue and it worked for a day and then it broke when I wrote a unit test that actually made sure it was right. And I fixed all those bugs and then it passed the unit test for six months and then one day failed because uh, yeah, it's very easy to get these lock-free algorithms wrong. So there are, if you're interested in this stuff, it's fun to go and research it and try and write one, but you should really download an open source one or there's ones built into the Microsoft libraries or um, that kind of thing. Um, but most of them work on a kind of transactional nature where you have a loop that's trying to do a task and you've got compare and swap at the end and the compare and swap tells you whether you succeeded or not. And if you didn't succeed, you just do the loop again and you keep trying brute force until you've, you've managed to do it without another thread stomping you. Um, but lock free, it's easy to get carried away in all these low level optimization details. It's actually defined um, at a high level, kind of like big O notation is all about algorithms. It's not actually about these hardware details. So at the algorithmic level, a locking algorithm is one where there's a critical section and once a thread enters it, no other thread can enter it until that thread leaves. So basically if one thread enters it and the OS happens to put that thread to sleep because we're on Windows and it does that, then every other thread has to wait there and the whole system locks up until the OS decides to wake your thread back up and it leaves the critical section. So um, if you're writing missiles for the army or space capsules, you kind of these are the enemies of real-time systems because the whole thing can have a single linchpin that locks it up. So lock-free in algorithmic terms. So we're kind of interested in lock-free for the performance benefits of avoiding mutexes. But al algorithmically, lock-free is all about making sure that there's always a thread that can make progress. Even if the OS decides to randomly lock up your threads, other threads can butt in. So it's like I was saying with transactions. Lock-free algorithms usually operate in a loop where at the end of it, the end result is try and tra commit this transaction to memory. And if another thread has done so, you'll fail and you'll have to do the whole thing again, but otherwise you succeed. So if somebody's halfway through the critical section and Windows freezes that thread, you can come along and you can butt in and your transaction will succeed um, through brute force. But there's also a third category um, of algorithmic, algorithmic um, guarantees called wait-free. And wait three algorithms ensure that every single thread will always make progress. No thread can block up any other thread. And this just seems way better. So there's a, a there's this huge focus on lock free algorithms, but uh, we should really be looking for wait free stuff. And there's a lot of reasons you can't because wait free algorithm, algorithms are hard to make in general. Uh, we can make a really quick one right now though for this shared pointer example. So shared pointer, it's a, it's a lock-free algorithm because it uses an atomic increment for the counter. So um, no thread can kind of get stuck in that lock and hold everyone else up. So we can make a, a weight-free version of shared pointer now if we want. With we'll, we'll have to make a few assumptions though. So I'm going to assume that every object has an ID from zero up to some pre-allocated max objects. Every thread in our thread pool has an ID from zero up to max threads. And I'm going to invent the idea that 
our main loop of our game operates in a fixed number of phases. So we've got like an update phase, and then a cleanup phase, and then a rendering phase. And every thread is always going to be in the same phase. So every thread is doing update work, or every thread is doing cleanup work, or every thread is doing rendering work. And if I make those assumptions, and I say that we can modify the counters in update, and we can read them in cleanup. But we can't, we can't read them in update and we can't modify them in cleanup. And that lets us build this wait-free version. So you usually have to add a few extra restrictions on your system. And the other thing we have to do is there's usually a huge memory overhead for <laughs> wait-free algorithms. So if we start building this thing, I'm going to pre-allocate all of the reference counters that we'll ever need. And instead of just having one per object, I need to have one counter per object per thread that is in our system. And then um, I'm going to assume there's this magic function current thread index, which gives us a, a number from zero up to max threads of which thread is, is currently running. So all we're doing here is I'm asserting that we're in the update phase, because that was my assumption. And then I'm incrementing the counter for this thread's copy of the object ID. And this doesn't need any synchronization, because every thread is using a different int integer here. So this avoids the overhead of atomic instructions, even. And decrements the same, but it's got minus minus instead of plus plus. And then the interesting thing is, if we want to know what a reference count is here, some of those reference counts might actually be negative. So if we acquired a reference on one thread and then we decremented it on another thread, one of the counters will be positive one and one of the counters will be negative one. So what we do is we loop through here. We've got a for loop that loops through every thread and just adds up the counters. So we'd, we'd get like plus one, plus negative one equals zero for a, a count of zero. Um, and this is only safe because I've made this assumption about the phases, where in the cleanup phase, every thread is in cleanup and no threads are going to be writing to this data. So this data becomes read-only, and read-only data is thread safe. So instead of having atomics attached to every object and locks attached to every object, if you can just guarantee that your threads are operating inside these kind of phases, you can have a single synchronization point. You have one synchronization point that says, okay, we're finished with update, now we're doing cleanup. And you can have a million objects and there's still just that one synchronization point. This kind of stuff scales way better. Um, so that's why you want your individual objects to not do anything. You, do, you want them to not be thread safe. So then we can, instead of it externally synchronizing them with mutexes, we can externally synchronize them with some much higher level um, methods, such as this phase idea. Um, which, yeah, brings up the key thing to, to making multi-threaded games that perform well. It's not about locks or anything like that, like in my sophomoric high school or university answer. The um, actual answer is that it's all about scheduling. So you need to figure out how to schedule your game. Um, and locks are, yeah, locks are just a clumsy way to make sure that your schedule is correct. And they're a clumsy way to make sure that one thread owns it and or that you know, every thread can read it, no thread owns it, to transition objects around. Um, so in that previous example, we had one synchronization point that transitioned all of our objects at the same time instead of one lock per object. Um, and if we visualize that, basically blue is frame one, orange is frame two. So we've got update, clean up, render, update, clean up, render. The little green bars are our threads doing work. And we just, with those purple vertical bars, they're our synchronization points. And we just need to make sure that every thread has finished each phase before any of them enter the next phase. So you, you pay some cost in this. You'll never have full thread utilization in your thread pool because you'll always have some startup time and some wind down time at the start and the end of each phase. But in the middle of each phase, you can try and keep every thread quite busy, as long as you've got enough data parallel work that you can throw at them. So the next topic is shared state. And this is why people think multi-threading is hard, because you get taught shared state programming. And shared state is where all the bugs come from if you don't synchronize things properly. So you should get taught there's two ways to do concurrency. There's shared state and there's message passing. And we need both of them, although we really should focus on message passing. It's, it's what we should default to when we're not forced to use one or the other, because shared state basically is just the root of all of our problems. Um, 
And if you have bad shared state code, you know, you end up corrupting memory and you can cra you, your program will crash or worse than crash, you corrupt people's save games and all sorts of bad things happen. Um, some other options that you should look into if you're researching this later is coroutines and fibers, um, but I'm not going to talk about them today. So, a lot of the time you're using, you might not think that you're using message passing in your game, but obviously if you've got multiplayer, the internet is a message passing system. Any network programming breaks your game state down into messages to send to the other computer. But even if you've written a game from scratch and you're using OpenGL or Direct3D, they're built on message passing. So when you call a function like OpenGL draw, it doesn't do anything immediately. All it does is it validates that your arguments are correct and it constructs a message to a driver thread. Um, and then the driver thread gets that message and converts your arguments into the native format of the GPU. And then when it decides that its command buffer is full, it sends a message to the OS thread containing the command buffer. And the OS gets that and actually enqueues it for execution by the GPU. And then that's a message over the PCI bus, and then eventually, at some point in the future, the GPU is going to start executing your draw commands. Um, and this is all super high performance stuff. So people often have this misconception that sending messages around the place is quite expensive, when a lot of the stuff that you use day to day is built on top of it. Um, but even if you're building everything on top of message passing, there's shared state everywhere. Obviously, our PCs are just a giant block of RAM. And RAM is just a huge bank of shared state. So no matter what you do, if you're using message passing, underneath it's built on top of shared state. So if you're using the internet, it's running on your TCP IP driver, and your driver's sitting in RAM using shared state. But then actually, you know, some engines will do stuff like they'll automatically sync your entities over the network. So you can pretend that you're using shared state, even though it's on top of a message passing system. And then that's on top of a driver that's built using RAM, which is a big bank of shared state, and then that's running on a whole pile of electronics which talk over serial buses. Um, and if you go peek down at the lowest levels here, um, even say inside a typical PC CPU, to talk to memory, the cache has to send a whole bunch of messages. And when you use an atomic instruction, the L2 caches have to agree which cache owns that bit of memory at the time so that the other CPU cores don't get an erase condition. So even if you're just using an atomic instruction, which is like the core bit of shared state, there's message passing going on at incredible speed inside the CPU. And this was amazing on the um, PS3 where we had the cell CPUs. And they're actually using a, a ring network internally. If anyone remembers like token ring before Ethernet took over, um, you've actually got this big ring of SPUs and only the ones on the end have a memory controller that can talk to memory. The ones in the middle have to pass the parcel for your requests for RAM around the place. So these things are just sending little packets of RAM everywhere. So RAM seems like a big block of shared state, but it's really sent around using messages as well. So um, we shouldn't really be afraid of either. We use them both without knowing it. Um, the, other, the other contrast is mutable objects versus immutable objects. So when we, o OOP is kind of everywhere and Objects in OO are almost, it's kind of assumed that they're mutable. Some of the rules here, I'm talking about the, the single responsibility principle, um, they're defined in terms of why the object changes. So it just kind of assumes that every object's change, um, which might seem like an obvious assumption, like what good is an object that can't change? Um, so normally you've got kind of code where you've got uh, an update function and you've got an array of some kind of data here it's positions and you know this forms a feedback loop where you feed positions into update and that modifies them and produces new positions so if you don't have mutable objects you do the same thing but you create new objects to represent change over time so every single frame you produce a new list of positions and this seems like it should be crazy inefficient um, but depending on how your game works, you might have to touch every object anyway, so it can end up being the same cost. Um, and you might need this. Like earlier, we were interpolating game states um, between multiple frames, so our renderer could run faster than the actual update loop ran. And for that, you need kind of copies of everything anyway. So it's possible to use immutable, immutable objects for your entire game state, and it's a completely different way of thinking about it if you're kind of really stuck in that OO mindset. Um, and it 
if you're coming from a mathematical background, you might find this a lot more comfortable as well because um, some typical OO code will say positions that colon equals is an assignment operator. Positions gets assigned to this thing. And in math, you can't just rename it. You can't say x equals x plus 1. That's just not true. Like, that would be false to a mathematician. Um, so a mathematician would much, be much more comfortable saying that positions at time plus 1 is equal to the update function applied to positions at time. Um, this is much more formal. So a lot of work back in the 60s and 70s when we really cared about trying to glue math and programming together and formally prove that all of our code is right um, really relied on this stuff and it's fallen out of favour. But it is really useful when you're trying to make high-performance multi-threaded code to, to try and think in the immutable mindset which if you've used functional languages, they, they're much more likely to use this mindset than the kind of mutable OO mindset as well. So neither is the right choice. Immutable objects should be our right default. We should be thinking about immutable objects most of the time. Um, mutable state is the cause of all of our bugs. If you have these classes that have a thousand reasons to change, like OO actually says that's wrong. If we're writing OO properly, um, you should have the smallest amount of moving parts in your classes as possible. But this is kind of just, this is just general programming advice. We care about immutable objects because immutable objects are thread safe. So there's usually some kind of production phase where you're building an object and it has to change during that time. But then afterwards you transition into the consumption phase and then as long as it's immutable from that point onwards, then you don't have to do any synchronization. So the more stuff that you can turn into immutable objects at some point in time, the better. It's going to make your life way easier. And I talked about these phases before where we can have a producer phase and we make sure that every thread has finished it and then we start every thread doing the consumption phase. If you want to do things much more fine-grained than those lock-free queues I was talking about, after you've produced an object and it's ready for consumption, a lot of systems work by you pass all your data through these, these queues and you can have some, something that's just polling this queue for data that it's going to consume. So the next topic is data flow. Um, so we all hate spaghetti code. Spaghetti code is code that's too hard to follow because somebody used a lot of go-tos and threads and callbacks and whatever. Um, I'm actually going to rock the boat and say, everyone's seen this. You've got a vector or some kind of collection of entities. And for each entity, you call a virtual update function. That's just, it's just bullshit. It's bad and wrong. And everyone does it, but we need to get away from it because it makes my life hell trying to parallelize the game when you do this. Because this is, this is spaghetti code. You look at that and you say, what does this actually do? And you don't know. You're like, which, what memory does this touch? What does it modify? What does it read? What does it write? You, you can't answer any of those questions. So this is why a decade ago, everyone said that games couldn't be multi-threaded because everyone wrote this kind of code and it just doesn't, doesn't map. So spaghetti data flow, um, as well as that kind of generic virtual function where you're just saying, hey, you update, I don't care what that is, just do, do something. Uh, it also comes from objects that are very re uh, reactive. So you call a function on it and they call a function on someone else and you end up with these really deep call stacks where you push a key on the keyboard and that triggers an on attack key function, which tells a weapon to do its on-shoot function, which spawns an explosion object, which immediately triggers its on-touch function five times in five players, which call on-damage, which spawn particles and do stuff in their on-spawn. And if you're trying to make a parallel engine, then this has just touched five different systems straight away. So the amount of data that you kind of need to be thread-safe for this is just exponential as these little tentacles go out and touch every system in the game. Um, which again makes my life really hard. Um, so the question that you need to answer to make something parallelizable is what memory addresses are going to be read and written by this procedure? And with this, you know, what does on, on attack key touch? Which bits of memory does it touch? In this system, you can't answer that. It just goes too deep and it spreads out and all of a sudden half the code in your game has been triggered by it. Um, so you really need to untangle these deep call graphs. So in that example where we spawned an explosion 
and then it immediately started spawning particles because it had touched players and damaged them. Instead of actually running that code immediately and saying, let's, let's run these players on touch functions, um, the, the kind of simple generalized way to simplify this is to make a queue of events and you put all of those on damage calls into that queue so that you can call them in a big batch process later. And even if you're making a single threaded code, it seems like it should be overhead. Like instead of doing the work now, you're saying you're gonna do it later. So there's bookkeeping and events and lists and stuff. But when you get down to optimizing for memory usage, which is kind of, it's the main thing that we optimize for these days. CPU cycles are cheap, but moving data in and out of RAM is really expensive these days. Um, so you kind of, you want everything in your engine to be a batch operation anyway, where you're gonna do the same task six times. You don't wanna constantly be jumping between doing different tasks. So if you can batch up all those calls to like on damage and then give that batch of events to another system that's gonna loop through six players, then you're actually gonna get better single, single threaded performance because of the memory access patterns in that are gonna be predictable. Um, and a benefit of that, as well as making a single threaded code better it means that you find data parallel stuff that you didn't know was there. So before, with that big deep call graph, you kind of say, well, this is just doing a whole bunch of serial operations. I can't see any patterns in here where I can use fork join. But if you know, here's a list of six players that need to spawn their particles. That's one operation that's independently working on six objects. So you can, you can spawn six jobs to do that work. Um, if you batch up all of your work and sort by type of object. So virtual calls are kind of the, the antithesis of this because they say, I don't care what the type of the object is, just go and run the code now. Whereas if you collect your objects and you sort them by type, you know exactly what the code is that you're gonna run and you know the memory that it's gonna touch. Especially if your objects don't go off and touch other objects, you kind of need to limit the length of those chains. So OO is great. There's a lot of rants on the internet about how bad OO is and how it's the worst thing that we all got taught and we should unlearn it. Um, I'm a big defender of it, but it has limits. So it's great for writing components, small parts, like the, the small low level parts of your game. They should all be objects that follow the strict rules of OO. Um, but the high level stuff where you're trying to schedule how your frame runs, uh, it's really terrible for that. So for the high level stuff, I actually prefer writing procedural code with a functional mindset, which is basically thinking about immutable objects. Um, so instead of saying for all of the things run their update function, you wanna be specific. So if we do a quick example, we might have a physics engine. This is super high level. We've got an old physics state and we give it the old physics state and a time and it gives us back a new physics state. And the same thing for our animation system. We've got our old animation state the elapsed time, we'll get a new animation state out of that. Um, and then we might have some kind of scene graph. So we get the physics state and the animation state and the old scene graph nodes, and that gives us new scene graph nodes. Um, and then we might want to frost and color those new scene graph nodes to get a list of visible ones and then render them using a camera. Um, so each of these are much closer to a pure function, which means there's no hidden state, which means you can you can look at this and you can figure out how to parallelize it. Um, we can see how the data flows through this. It's just straightforward. There's a lot of engines where there's these fancy entity component systems and there's this big thing about update order um, and you need to make sure you've got all your systems in the right update order or you get out of sync bugs where you might have the animations from the wrong frame being, uh, sending their data through. But if you write it as procedural code like this with immutable objects, it's impossible to get the update order wrong. It falls out. Like if you try and do frost and color earlier, you don't have the nodes yet that you're gonna put into it. Whereas if you've got kind of long lived mutable objects and you recycle the same objects every frame, it's possible to reorder this because you're not um, producing these new objects that you need. So this makes sure that you've got your update order in the right order. And we can see exactly how the flow of control happens here. We don't, we're not jumping off into abstract into the update and not knowing what's happening. So from this kind of code, we can take each line of this code and we can start constructing a directed acyclic graph. Um, so here we've got the physics step, step function. We're passing the old state and the elapsed time into that and that gives us a new state. We've got the same thing for the animation system. 
we pass the old anim state in and the time, and that produces a new uh, animation state. And we can see here, these two function calls, they don't conflict with each other. They don't share any writable data. They share readable data, but it's all read only. So they can actually run in parallel by drawing out these diagrams that just fall out from the code. We can spot which systems we can actually run in parallel in different threads. Then if we continue with this, we've got update positions, which consumes that data. So then we know if these are spawned as jobs, we know that the update positions job must wait on the update animations and the physics step job. If it doesn't wait, there'll be a, you know, a race condition. So we see where we can spawn systems in parallel, and we see where systems have to wait on each other, the data dependencies. So this kind of code, it makes your data dependencies visible. These kind of diagrams, if you have a typical OO system full of abstract function calls, you can't generate these kind of diagrams out of it, and you can't find your opportunities for parallelism. They're just hidden away and made invisible. So once we've got this diagram, each of those vertical steps of the function calls and the green blocks, they're a kind of, they're a weight section. So we can put this into one of our diagrams that we were drawing earlier with the vertical purple lines. So these become phases where we know that we can do physics and animation at the same time in the same phase, but we need to make sure that every thread has finished that phase before we enter the update positions phase. Um, and then internally, if we say that each of these these functions has data parallel operations in it. So update positions might operate on a thousand positions. So we can give 250 of them to four threads and, and run those through the job system. So as well as these, these systems, in, internally these systems are gonna use the job system to spread out over as many threads as they can. Um, and for the sake of argument, I'm gonna assume that the renderer here is a terrible legacy direct 3 9 renderer that can't spread out over multiple threads. So then our timeline would end up looking like this where we've got all of our threads running physics and animation just randomly into leave there out of the job system, and then they all wait for those to finish, and then all of them start updating positions, and they all start doing custom culling, and then they all sync up, and one of them does render, because it's legacy code. So this is what most games should have a timeline that looks like. Um, and I'll kind of hit an hour on the dot, but I've got some future stuff if anyone wants to hang around. This is kind of stuff that we're working on at the moment, which may or may not be good ideas. So one thing we're working on is those directed acyclic graphs. We're trying to construct them automatically from futures and promises. And futures and promises exist in the C++ standard library now, so as a concept. Uh, we kind of got our own version of them. And the way they work in general is you can, get a, you can return a future out of a function before that function has actually generated the data. So say physics step might return a future physics state, um, and the future physics state is kind of a handle or a placeholder um, that you can have which, you can get a physics state out of it, but when you try and get the physics state out of it, it'll block until the work is actually done. So that lets you spawn some jobs in return immediately, which lets the main thread go off and able to do some other stuff in the middle. And then when you try and get that physics state out on line number two here, it would actually block until physics steps actually finish doing the work. Um, so this is ugly as sin, but this is the, the kind of thing we're working on now where instead of actually calling the functions, we've got a call buffer, which is a, an object that you can push a function call into and it'll make that function call at a later point in time. So here we're making a lambda, which will execute the phys physics step function. So we don't actually call physics step, we make a lambda that's going to call physics step and we push that into the call buffer. And then we do the same things for, for update positions. So then on line number four, when we call b.compile, ha we haven't actually called physics step or update positions at that point. We've just showed the call buffer what our structure of calls is going to be. And it can analyze the relationship between the arguments and the futures. And because physics state here is passed into update positions, when it's compiling this graph, it can detect that dependency between them, and it can automatically figure out that the second function call is dependent on the first. So it's gonna do what we did in the, in the direct of those cyclic graph diagram, and it's gonna detect where concurrency can occur, and it's gonna detect where there's data dependencies. So we compile that into a job graph on line four, and then we run it on line five, which is gonna push, push jobs into the job system and insert wait statements between them. <laughs> 
Um, and because this is so ugly, um, a way to clean that up is to bind it to Lua. So this is the same thing, but in Lua the code looks, besides uh, line two where we call call buffer begin and on line five where we call call buffer to end, it looks like regular serial single threaded code. So you can write your, update, your main loop of your program, which is the relationship between the different systems and the order that they have to update in. You can write this as a nice serial program and then have some kind of compiler analyze it and find the concurrency and find the data dependencies and create your schedule for you. Um, that's pretty much that. I'll skip over that one. So, thanks. <laughs> Well, yeah, so transitioning in and out of Lua is expensive. It's like five times the cost of a C function call. But if you're just doing that for the high level stuff, so scheduling your main loop, you know, that's a couple of microseconds of work, so you don't care if it's five times more expensive. As long as your, your low level stuff is, is optimal, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So I don't actually use that that reference counting system. Um, we have in a in a previous engine, but we don't have very much reference counting in the current engine. Um, so if you've got, say, you've got eight threads, you've got eight times more data there, and it's actually the other downside of that algorithm is you need to poll the reference counts at the end. It, you don't automatically find out that they're there. So you've got this cleanup pass where you could go check them all. So yeah, obviously that's going to touch a lot of memory and application misses. But the thing that it's relieving is every atomic increment is basically a cache miss. It's quite expensive. So it's um, you need to profile and look at your own data and, and find out whether um, one set of cache misses is more than the other set. <laughs> yep. I guess just to find out what is it worth I mean, is it worth doing something like that in C++ where first there's maybe two or maybe even a habit Yeah. Um, well, it kind of depends on your platform. So Rust doesn't have a big game development culture yet. C++ obviously has a shit ton of momentum. So even if it's not the best language, we kind of just use it because it's the language that we use. It's kind of self-fulfilling. <laughs> um, but if you're making a console game, you've got six or seven cores which are underclocked to a third or a quarter of the speed that they should be running in a PC. So it's really important on a console game to use a lot of the cores. But on a PC game, if you're making an indie game and it runs on one core, then yeah, just, just make it run on one core. Or yeah, if you're brave enough to use a new language, then do that as well. <laughs> uh, do you utilize the um, stuff that Beyond Spurs talk about with the, uh, uh, just released it last year? The, the C++ core guidelines? Core guidelines, that's the one. Uh, I'm the, GSL. the GSL. I'm not using the GSL yet, but I am excited about it because it makes C++ a lot more modern and sane. Yeah, and um, if I could briefly ask a second question, uh, Jonathan Blow uh, talked about that programming language called JAI, yeah. uh, which is designed to solve a lot of the problems with C. Have you read about it or have you... I'm not following it closely, but that, that's an exciting development as well. But yeah, again, it's got the issue that any language that isn't C++ has which is um, like we're all using C++. So <laughs> if, you, if you can sway people over and get some momentum going, that'd be great. Yeah, so if you've got a single thread, a single thread, so a lot of engines have a single thread which spawn jobs. And then, so there's basically, the, the main thread runs the main loop and then every other thread runs the job loop. Mm -hmm. And that kind of architecture, the main thread can yeah, basically wait on the job handles that it spawned during that phase. Yep. Um, if you've got multiple threads running main loops, 
then basically you can have a counter, and as each thread gets to the end, they can do an atomic increment on that counter. And if you know you've got four threads, yeah. then you wait until that counter reaches four, and you know all of them have, have left that, that section. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I was Yep. Um, in some languages, finding the ID from thread is stupidly expensive. Um, is there any other way that you can do that? No? Well, yeah, so on x86, it's not too bad to find a thread ID. Um, there's an unused register on x86 um, that points to a table of thread local data. But yeah, on, on other languages, there's like an extra couple of layers of indirection to get to the yeah, thread local so data. Yeah, it's still it's still kind of expensive. It's chasing a couple of pointers, so it's probably about the cost of a cache miss to find that out. So you can also um, it's a pain in the ass, but if you're only doing it in high level systems, you can pass it around as an argument. You can so track, yeah, track yeah. It so just basically pass it through every single argument and every call yeah. list. Um, maybe you can make a code generator that appends that argument on automatically. <laughs> So that, that's the thing that, that future uh, the more modern languages could do is they could make that kind of thing easier. Yeah, well, C sharp now compiles a problem you Fibers and things. Well, a, a strand can change and then two simultaneous renders can come at the same time. Like well, they'll be queued there. Then. Um, yeah, so some of those jobs, I um, actually have a system where. So, yeah, you might have like a render thread, but any, any thread can acquire that. So you can have that render job sitting there and you know that only one thread can do it and you can't have two threads doing it at the same time. But if the render thread's gone off and pulled a really expensive job out of the queue for some reason, then another thread can come along and whoever gets to the rendering task first, it'll become the render thread for that frame. Um, yeah, so you can kind of make... If, yeah, if you've got systems that have to be on one thread, then when, when you've finished with that system for the frame, you can basically say this is up for being claimed and whoever gets to it first can claim it and do the work. Um, that kind of stuff is... Um, yeah, kind of depend on how you set up your job system. But it's something to be aware of that you're going to have to deal with legacy single threaded stuff like that, yeah. Ah, uh, no. Cam? Cam, Cam's making it. Oh, sorry. One last question then. <laughs> Uh, I do need to figure out some, some better answers to that question. But the, the visualisation that I showed of um, if you do your profiling data, which is useful for optimising, but yeah, you can also use that to spot when things are running when they shouldn't be.